Hello, welcome to Board Deck and Dice. Today we are going to be donning the purple of the Roman Emperor and trying to keep hold of that title in our family as long as possible. I have got a prototype copy of Donning the Purple, which I'm going to show you very briefly how to pay, play. There's a lot in the game, so I'm not going to get through it all in an immense amount of detail. And I do have to say that this one came to me after the Kickstarter had started, so I haven't had as many plays as I normally would uh, to make my judgments. So just bear that in mind. Let's go see how it plays roughly, and uh, we'll see what I think after that. So here we are taking a quick look at Donning the Purple. There's quite a lot to go over in this game, so I'm just going to give you a brief overview. We've also done a first play, and I will link to uh, Gaming Night's playthrough so you can understand a bit more of the way the game works uh, if you are interested. In Donning the Purple, each player is going to take randomly signed card. Now we'll talk about these cards in a minute because they are where a lot of the uh, actions are taken in the game. But some will start as the Emperor, some will start as the Emperor's heir and some will start as the leader of the Senate. Uh, each round there will be enemies that income into each of the four regions. This is the centre of, of the Roman Empire and therefore kind of counts as a region on its own, but there is region one, region two, region three, and region four. And those enemies are decided, there's six provinces in each region, you roll a dice for each one, and you bring in two enemies. The red cubes represent legions, and each cube has a strength, a base strength of one. Then those enemies will move. They follow the number order towards the center. So this one will go from three to four and later on four to five. If they can ever meet a position of equal strength, they cannot move in and they will simply wait there until in future turns, more enemies join them. And then as a group of four, they move in and take out those uh, legionaries. Um, so all every game you have this progression of enemies um, towards the capitals trying to encroach on and the strength really matters. They're meant to go this way aren't they? <laughs> there we go there. Um, so the strength of your legionaries and your marker matters. Your marker is worth a base of strength too. Then you will roll a four-sided dice to see which of the four regions has famine. Famine stops that region producing grain. Also, if enemies go into your farm in that region, there will be no grain produced. If you have a building in that region when the enemies come in, that building will be destroyed and returned to its owner. So enemies are a bad thing, but they're also a way of winning the favour of the people and uh, getting yourself various bonuses. After the enemies are moved, the Emperor will look at every farm that is not under famine or enemy control and will take this much grain tokens onto the Emperor's board. The Emperor, different to other players, has a little side tab to his board that he, can, um, he or she can use for extra actions. <clears throat> then we come to the drawing cards part. At the start of the game, every player will have drawn a hidden agenda card, which is a end game scoring card, and a plot card, which can be used in a couple of ways. The first is for its action at any time, and the second is for its strength in fights, but not uh, not in ass no in assassinations as well, I believe. Yes, you can use it to bolster your assassinations which I will talk about later. The Emperor will then draw and resolve five event cards as standard. And these are usually pretty bad for the Emperor. Um, they will have to make some tough choices that will impact later on. But should they last the whole year as Emperor, they're going to get a lot of money potentially. So this is one of the ways that the Emperor is kind of hobbled. After they've done their events, the Emperor then draws a forum card which gives everyone another place to place their workers in the worker placement round. Then we will move to player actions which I'll talk about separately when we look at the player board. Um, 
Uh, then we will move to the place building phase. So any buildings up here, the first four will be placed on the map by the colour of the person who played it. And uh, the only rule is that apart from this starting one where you get these starting buildings uh, right at the start of the game and they can't be moved, you can only place a building uh, where there isn't another building or enemies. The head of the Senate, in this case Black, can choose to reorder the buildings. Why might they want to do that? We'll say they've only got one in there and their one is at number six. They might think, well, if I do this, I'm going to get to build two buildings this round. Uh, they can only swap the place of two buildings, but uh, that gives them a bit of an advantage. All those buildings are placed onto the board. Then the Emperor has to distribute food. Food has to go to every region where there are no enemies present. So, in this case, we have one, two, three, four. There's 25 regions, so we would have to feed 21 regions. You feed from the grain you harvested earlier, which can be up to 3, 6, 9, uh, 15, 18. Uh, any grain that the Emperor doesn't have will either lose happiness for the people or they can pay for it with uh, at the current grain price, which is two per grain. Should they manage to feed every person, every region, then they get a happiness point. Then taxes will be collected. Players get five for every estate they've built on the map and the Emperor gets um, a coin for every fed region every region it's free of enemies so they will get 21 coins at that stage as well the end of the year the emperor will score points to the value underneath the happiness track and um then everything will be set up to go again that is a basic run through the round you're going to do that four times but things get a lot more complicated when we look at the player boards. We will look at the Emperor player board. Move that over there. Because that's the one I've set up. And we will zoom, 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 zoom. So here we have the Emperor's player board. Now, this is starting player as Emperor. So um, if the Emperor ever dies uh, by the happiness track going down or by being assassinated, they just simply pass this little tab onto the new Emperor. The ranking for Emperor goes uh, heir first. If there's not an heir, then it goes to the leader of the Senate. So on here we see a number of things. There's a place to track grain, place to track victory. This is, again, unique for the Emperor. A place to track uh, grain, place to put out aqueducts, which give you the people happiness and prevent famine. You can move and add legions and you can choose an heir. This is the same for every player. Uh, the actions available to you are to move, to bribe a senate, senator, which means getting a place on the senate, to assassinate a senator and take a plot card, or attempt to assassinate, to attempt to assassinate the current empire and take a plot card, build an estate or build a monument. Monuments go into the building track, but they don't go onto the map. They come down here and give you a permanent upgrade. So after you've built your first monument, you get one strength. After you've built your second, you get plus one to assassination attempts. And after you've built your third, you will get two victory points at the end. There can be extra costs for taking actions. What's really neat about this system is the workers are your stamina. So on a round, you may put two out, three of you are the emperor. And then at the end of the round, those go into your used stamina. This is your health. This is how much time you've got left before you die. There are some ways of getting stamina back in there, but generally, once you run out of this, you're going to die. And if you're the Emperor, that's bad news. If you die, you take a minus victory point, um, and then you put all your stamina back up, and another family member steps into your place. You may also notice that some actions have C's on. These can be copied by other players for their monetary cost and for stamina. So if another player moves and I want to move too, I can do uh, that and move my pawn. Or if someone bribes a senator, I can do it too and also pay the required cost. Moving your pawn around, pawn around is a useful strategy because with your strength you are able to take on 
the enemies and clear them from the map. Should you clear enemies from the map, you get a happiness point added onto the happiness track and you roll a six-sided dice for each enemy that you dispatched. So uh, this is called the glory dice and in current form, prototype form, one gets you a plot card, six lets you recover a stamina and two to five get you that value in money. That is a very brief look at how to play Donning the Purple. Donning the Purple is a, I'm aware I use this word intriguing quite a lot and it feels like a bit of a catch-all when you don't want to say a game's really good. Donning the Purple is an intriguing game but it's also a really, really good game. Um, I was surprised how much this one stayed uh, with us in terms of talking about what happened and the mechanics. Uh, and basically you've got quite a lot of simple straightforward mechanics um, that you're just needing to learn the rhythm of. So uh, probably my biggest criticism is that flow of the year takes a year, not in real time, to get used to. Uh, but then after that, yeah, you're flicking through the rulebook to check the odd thing, like about the army movement or strength or when you can add a strength card. But it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, but I really recommend just going through the rulebook for the first year and then in your first game and essentially playing a three year one after you set up that first year. Um, but yeah, it's really intriguing. It's described on the Kickstarter page as a king of the hill game with a bit of worker placement. I actually think that's a little misleading because the worker placement for me should be centre stage in this game because you're using your stamina. Um, so you're using your age or your life force to perform these actions, which kind of makes sense. Uh, and, and then your life is shortening through the excess of doing this. And I really like that system because everything you do costs you. And when you're the emperor particularly and you're looking at these other two players who uh, the best way to score points is to be the emperor with a happy people. Um, and you're looking at these other two people who have to kind of work with you to some degree because there are group losing conditions, but also don't want the people to be too happy until they're ready to stab you in the back and take over. It's um, so clever. Um, the uh, asymmetric nature only really comes in with the Emperor. Um, and those starting mats are all the same apart from the roles. The emperor has a whole other mat, one where they can assign themselves as their own, as the, you know, they can assign an heir, so they carry on the emperor through their, um, through their, when they die, that player maintains the emperor's ship. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the tracks in the game, the senate works well, the way that you can see which buildings are coming out, and if you're a senator, you can mess with that. The following action is, it's been done in other games, but it's really, um, really well done here because again, it's costing you stamina, it's costing you your life, but even if the last player goes, yeah, I'm gonna go in the Senate, and um, they take a seat making them the head of the Senate, then everyone gets a chance to follow that. The balance for the Emperor is really intricate and yes, they have to pay out a lot in the events and feeding the people, but then they get all that money back. So if you're not the Emperor, you're thinking a good way for me to get some bonuses is to go and take out the enemies. However, this has a number of effects. It makes it more expensive for the Emperor to feed the people, but it also gives the Emperor more money in the tax phase and makes the people happier. So do you kind of ignore some to make a big group, but again, that gives the emperor more money. It's just super clever. Um, for me, this reminds me of a area control game in the same way adrenaline reminds me of an area control game. In adrenaline, the area control is on people's lives. And here it's sort of the same. The area control is that position of emperor. So maybe it's title control, I don't know. Um, holding on to that title or letting it go early and then choosing to strike back at the right time. My favourite moment in this game was when um, my plan, my, I love it when a plan comes together, uh, my plan to uh, take the Emperor uh, ship came into effect just at the end of the penultimate year. So I knew the current Emperor was going to die and I was pretty sure 
that when he, d he, he had installed a, an heir, so he was going to carry on as the new emperor, but I knew that he wouldn't be able to feed the people because there was too high a demand. The grain cost too much. He didn't have enough grain. So I assassinated the, the current emperor. The new emperor came into position and the, the happiness of the people went way down because he couldn't feed them and he died again and I was head of the Senate. I took that emperorship. I'd been building a, he, a good bank balance of cash and I was emperor for the rest of the game and I went on to win by a good margin. And it was just perfect. It reminded me of... Uh, Comet and, and Inish to a degree where that victory can seemingly come out of nowhere but you feel like you've put a plan into place and acted it out. So Donning the Purple, if you can't tell, has won me over. If you want a fairly different game uh, that has clever worker placement and um, some uh, just really good mechanics, yeah it takes your head, head around to get, uh, takes you, you around to get your head around the mechanics and me to learn to speak um, but uh, it's been well worth it for me. I only played it at three players, I glanced at the two player rules and I think there's solo rules coming as well. Um, the two player rules didn't do much to inspire my confidence in a two player game because you are losing a whole player and I think a lot of the intrigue comes from, from the, that three way relationship um, but I didn't try it so uh, bear that in mind. So thanks very much for watching Board Deck and Dice. Go and check out Donning the Purple if the Kickstarter is still on, if I've managed to edit this in time. Uh, if not, look for it to come to retail. Thanks very much for watching. We will see you next time.